happening? We don't know who is signing up on, to the live stream on uh, YouTube, do we? Um, I think that uh, I can I can check that in a second, uh, but I'm on the Zoom right now. But I'll I'll yeah. open it. And, no, I just um, I mentioned I asked that question because I wanted to explain to people. Um, I think that those who registered for the webinar uh, uh, don't know the full um, context. So since it's time for me to be in, let me just describe that and uh, and get started. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for everyone um, uh, for joining us. This um, this seminar was initially um, conceived as a as a little test run for the seminars that will be coming in the course of the summer in in our normal program, and also for other events that we have hoped to put together um, using this online platform. Uh, actually, I say this online platform, we, we're, we have just put this together itself, since it's a bit of a cobbling together of, of um, a different uh, software programs. We have, um, uh, of course, the Zoom um, uh, facility, but we are also using Google Classroom, as, uh, as you know. And at the same time, we will be recording with, with um, Vimeo. Um, so we have these three, um, uh, three, three platforms at work, and we thought that we would try it out for this, um, this little mini seminar, this uh, um, uh, mini seminar in the sense it's half the size of what we will be doing in the, um, in the course of the summer in our sessions. Um, but as it happened, as soon as we announced this, um, this webinar, we had uh, uh, the, the space filled up. Uh, we had a hundred spaces available. I, I was hoping maybe 12 people would show up, but uh, no, it, it instantly filled up. And um, we then uh, moved to, um, to, to a live streaming facility on our official YouTube channel. So many of you are watching on YouTube and that's what I was asking Piruz a moment ago, do we know who's there? Um, but uh, when I, I last heard uh, from Nemanja, a message yesterday, there were over 300 people registered. So that's very, very exciting. And um, I, I'm, I'm just delighted. It's, it's exciting to know that so many people are, are watching what we're doing um, at the EGS right now and, um, and are eager to, to join us. Um, so, it's 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 very encouraging. It also opens some very interesting questions for us. It's it 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 points to possibilities with this medium that we haven't um, explored before. Um, I think that uh, many of you will know. I mean, if you if you are here, you know who we are. <laughs> you're being graduate school. In other words, you've reached us through our publication channel, publicity channels. Um, and I think you know who I am, uh, Christopher Fins, the dean of the PAC division. Um, but you may not be aware of, of a letter that I wrote a, uh, a few weeks ago in which I described some of our plans for this year before the pandemic came. And those included um, a, a, a set of collaborative relations with um, institutions around the world, in China, uh, Dakar, um, Bergamo in Italy, uh, Dartington Hall in the UK, and also the um, 17 in Mexico City, our, our longtime friend. Um, so we were going to be um, globalizing in, in some respects. We've always been trying to reach out to, to uh, countries around the world, but we have found that it's difficult to bring uh, people um, to Switzerland or to Malta. And uh, because, first of all, because of the cost involved, but it's also a very long way and it's, it's a big commitment. So it has been for us a, a real question as to how to reach out, how to take the EGS to different audiences. And uh, that's really our ambition. It's not about, um, you know, a kind of growth prospect. It's really about trying to create new conversations and to reach those that we have been trying to reach for, for some time. So suddenly, the, uh, with the urgency, um, which, which we found ourselves in with this situation with the pandemic, uh, we, we discover, in some sense, the online possibility, which I would have to say we have been somewhat um, resistant about in the past. Um, there are actually some formal reasons for that um, in our, our accreditation um, and our recognition by the Department of Education in the US. 
but uh, I think that we have participated in a resistance to uh, 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 um, a distance learning, uh, which is prevalent in the humanities. But I, I think that so what's happened is a kind of breakthrough. Um, we now see possibilities that uh, we hadn't seen before. Um, we don't want to give up in any way our live events, uh, the, the seminars that we hold. For us, uh, for me, really, the, the teaching component of the EGS is absolutely the, the core of it. And, and that teaching occurs, has occurred for over 20 years in, in um, fairly intimate seminars. Um, but now we have new new possibilities and, and we want to explore these so this um this trial run has turned into something much more experimental and it also has had an impact on the um on the very idea of a seminar when when i um i, I let me say that the person who has um, led us in this the development of our online capacity is Nemanja Mitrovic, who is um, hosting this meeting. He's the official host for, for Zoom. Um, Nemanja has done extraordinary work, um, along with Piruz Kalaya, who is also who is, who is speaking to me a few moments ago. Um, Piruz is in um, Los Angeles. Um, Nemanja is in Belgrade, and I'm speaking from New York. Um, in any case, uh, we Nemanja proposed that I do this little seminar, um, this mini seminar, and uh, so I conceived of a topic and and a, and a, and a uh, protocol so, which would be suitable to a seminar, and then suddenly we had this extraordinary response, um, which meant that we couldn't use the webinar program in the way that we normally would in, in a session. And, and I did want to pause over that because what you're seeing now is not exactly what will happen during, um, I think, what will happen during a, a normal session because we'll use the Zoom, Zoom webinar um, software in order to um, enable a greater involvement of the participants. So they will be present um, in, in a way that um, you can't be uh, today. So this this is um, uh, you know this is some hybrid event, um, but it is it is uh, uh, it's very interesting and uh, it's also very challenging for me. I've I've never done something like this um, and uh, doing a seminar on a topic such as Antigone with um, hundreds of people is is a rather um, strange thing for me. But so I, I I'm grateful for your indulgence and 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 your patience. And um, uh, and I and I hope that it will be possible for there to still be some kind of seminar uh, relation here. Um, so let me say a word about that uh, that protocol, and then uh, move on from there to um, uh, the, the topic of the seminar and, and how I want to proceed in in the in the in the, in the hours coming. Um, we. Uh, we're, we're going to be accepting questions um, regarding my presentations in the, throughout the um, course of the, uh, the presentations, throughout the course of the seminar, and then, as I understand it, afterwards. Um, within the webinar there, uh, space, the Zoom webinar space, there's facility for that um, through the chat that is available to you. Um, and then for those who are following on the uh, live stream on YouTube, um, the, we invite you if, you, if you want to do this, to submit questions by email. Now, what will happen is that I will, um, actually, we will probably take stock in about 40 minutes and see what's happening. And um, I may answer some, if there's something urgent and immediate, I may uh, answer. Otherwise, I will plan to, <clears throat> um, Nemanja and Piruz will be collating this material, will be, will be uh, uh, collecting it, presenting it to me, and uh, I'll be able to see much of it. And then I will answer um, what I can, um, or rather, uh, um, what I can in a limited time. And, and so that means that I will be just uh, choosing some questions. Um, but there is, a, there is a possibility of feedback, of um, input, um, and so we, we invite you to, to use that and, and I'll do my best to be cognizant of, of what's happening. I, I, I find it very strange to teach a seminar without knowing what 
what people looked like in front of me. Um, it's it's uh, every teacher knows how important it is and, and how subtle these things are. It's it's. <clears throat> I think students usually don't realize that um, that the the teacher is reacting to every little shift in the chair, every little movement of a pencil or roll of an eye or whatever. Um, that's tremendously important for the for the for the dialogical uh, dimension of the seminar. Uh, even if this the, the 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 teacher is in a magisterial mode, um, this this exchange is going on all the time. So uh, I, all I've got in front of me is myself right now and uh, some pictures of some seals in Scotland as it happens. Um, and I um, I've, I've been reflecting on that and how strange that is. Um, but I realized that I don't recognize myself very much in, in the screen. Um, so at least I have a strangeness that I'm looking at. In any case, um, I, I just want to mention that we will be accepting these questions. I will try to respond a bit um, as we proceed. So tomorrow, perhaps a bit today, but tomorrow, the next day, and then uh, um, I presume we will also hold a session in which there is, is discussion. So uh, we are, this is very experimental, We're trying to uh, create a, a live seminar here. Um, and, and it's, uh, as I say, it's experimental with relation to what's coming in the summer in our session, in our session first of all, in August and uh, July and August. And then also in, in, in relation to some of the events that, that we will have. And I urge you to look to the news section of, the, um, uh, of our website and to Instagram for the announcements of those events. Okay, so um, yeah, the, the protocol then is that I'm going to speak uh, for um, three segments of an hour and a half. Um, I will, as I say, try to answer some, some of your, your input. Um, but on the whole, I'll be delivering um, three lectures. Um, I, I do want to underscore, and I want to move to what, I, what I, my topic, I, I haven't conceived of this as a seminar in a in a magisterial sense where I read lectures, for example, or I, I present something uh, prepared and, or carefully or articulated in advance. Um, I, I have approached this really with the attitude it would be something undertaken somewhat extemporaneously as, as I would normally do in a seminar. And, uh, and, and as I said, as I initially thought, it would be um, in a context of maybe 15 people, 15, 20 people. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I'm not going to be delivering lectures. I'm going to work through um, a, a set of questions that, um, that I have with respect to Antigone. Um, and I will, you know, there'll be a certain amount of improvisation. I, I will see where this goes, um, but I have a fairly clear idea of where I think I will go. So let me tell you just a little bit about that. I, I have lived with this text of Antigone for a very long time, um, I suppose as many of you have, um, but it's, it's something that is, um, it's often on my desk um, just by reason of the, the work that, that I've done since the um, beginning of my um, uh, professional career. Um, <clears throat> in choosing this text, I, I, I found myself before a real um, challenge, a real dilemma, um, because in this moment, it seemed to me uh, inappropriate to just trot out some uh, topic that I might address in a, in a theoretical manner. Um, it, it's, I, I have wanted very much to find a topic that would in, in some way speak to our moment. But at the same time, I have been very hesitant to you know, take up a, a work of art or, or a, a literary text or even a philosophical text and then try to uh, use it for some sort of theoretical statement about our, our moment. Um, I've, I've, I've wanted something else and um, Antigone, I'm hoping can, can give that. What, what, I'm, what I've been looking for is a text that can perhaps resonate in relation to our conditions. And I will try to explore it with that um, end in view in order to touch, if I can, what I feel as a, as a certain resonance in Antigone with the, the, the situation in which we're living. 
Um, and it's really for that purpose that, I, that I've undertaken this, uh, this seminar. In other words, I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to reach towards something in Antigone that has spoken to me for a long time and that I think is um, maybe pertinent to, to at least my experience uh, today. When I say my experience, let me just say that um, I, I think I, I probably, it's probably shared by, by most of you. Um, I, I look out of my window, I'm, I'm, I'm living on a street in, in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. I look out of my window, I see spring unfolding in a fairly uh, normal manner. Um, and yet I'm in isolation and semi-isolation, quarantine. Um, and I watch ambulances go by. Um, uh, yesterday there were two on my block. So it is a, in a certain sense, it's a very uncanny moment. Um, uncanny because I'm in my home, which is uh, very dear to me. I've done a lot of work on this house and I, I love it dearly. And I'm with my family. And so I have a, in a certain sense, um, a very supportive, a very comfortable um, situation, a domestic situation, but I am uh, looking out at a situation of extreme uncanniness. And that of course makes the, situation within the home, um, somewhat uncanny. Now in that, um, in that experience, I find myself um, almost searching for a way to be in touch with what is happening um, around me. I read the paper, of course, I, 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 I watch the news um, um, via the internet, basically. Um, I'm, I'm in touch with a lot of people in, in order to deal with EGS matters, I've had to decide constantly with Nemanja, uh, Piruz and others, uh, how should we proceed? Shall we, shall we go entirely online? How should we do this? It's, it's required an almost daily consultation for well over uh, six weeks, couple months. So the, the, the presence of the, this pandemic is very, very real, of course. But at the same time, I feel somewhat cut off from uh, from the suffering I know is unfolding. Um, and so I find myself find, seeking ways to, 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 to uh, come into relate, better relation with that. Um, in a certain sense, what, what I'm looking for is a capacity of a kind of remembrance. I, I, I don't want to read, you know, I don't want to read uh, Antigone seeking basis for some sort of sympathy um, with others immediately. Or, or yes, yes, sympathy, empathy, of course. Um, you know, the a feeling of a contact with what is happening uh, outside. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I'm trying to remember um, more profoundly uh, the meaning of what may be unfolding. Um, when I, when I evoke that remembrance, I, I recall a little text by Maurice Blanchot, and I, I'm going to be turning to Blanchot in the course of the seminar, but there's a little text in which, which has been, meant a lot to me in, in recent years, which touches upon this question of, of remembrance. Um, and I, I just wanna read a couple of lines from it. Um, when I say remembrance, I, I, of course, I, I, yes, a remembrance of suffering, also a remembrance of passing of death. Um, I, I find it very, very hard to uh, come to grips with the numbers that I read. Um, I, I, I watch the daily numbers in New York, it's staggering, the number of people newly infected every day, um, numbers, uh, infections, the number of deaths. And that I'm trying to, in some way, as I say, find a relation to this. And remember, in a, in a, remember what is perhaps most difficult to remember, which is um, our relation to our mortality and, and to death. So um, in this little text, which Blanchot wrote in 1993, so it's a very late text, and it is um, uh, for his friend, Robert Anten, he wrote the following. He says, it's, it's a text called In the Night That Is Watched Over. It's just, a, it's less than a page and I won't even read the entire thing, but, um, he starts out in the following way. He says, it is slowly in those nights when I sleep without sleeping that I became conscious, this word is inappropriate, of your proximity, which is distant nonetheless. I persuaded myself that you were not here. 
and excuse me, I persuaded myself that you were here, not you, but this repeated phrase, I'm going far away, I'm going far away. I immediately understood that Robert, so generous, so little concerned about himself, was not speaking to me about or for himself, but of all the places of extermination, of which, if it was him speaking, he listed a few. Listen to them, listen to those names. Treblinka, Chelmno, Benchek, Majdanek, Auschwitz, Sobibor, Birkno, Ravensbrück, Dachau. But I say, speaking, not speaking, do we forget? Yes, you forget. You forget all the more for remembering. Your memory does not impede you from living, from surviving, not even from loving me. But one does not love a dead person because then the meaning escapes you, the impossibility of meaning, the non-being and the impossibility of non-being. When I reread these lines, I know that I have already lost sight of Robert Antel the incomparable friend I knew. I'll stop there. There's a, something of a recovery in this text it goes, as he goes forward, as he affirms his ability to, ability to take up this uh, watch in the night. But the forgetting that I have wanted to, or the remembrance that I referred to a moment ago, I think is beautifully touched upon there. Um, the remembrance entails moving towards something that is somewhat is, is impossible uh, to, to grasp. And I think that Antigone um, is at grips with that. Um, Antigone herself and, and Antigone, the play. Um, I did some work on Antigone some years ago, um, which I will use as, as my point of departure. And that will be my primary reference today. Um, this work was on the topic of friendship in Antigone. And what I did was, and, and I, will, I will do this with you in a, in a moment, um, I went through the text and I studied all the instances of references, uh, uh, of, of reference to philia, um, love or friendship. And it is, um, as I, I discovered, um, it's, it's a term that the play turns upon. Um, in, in a um, really quite extraordinary way. There, there are four scenes, uh, which I will look at with you, I hope today to get started, to get into this play. There are four scenes in which the meaning of philia is, um, uh, well, in some cases debated, um, but in a certain sense fought for in, in this text. And my sense is, uh, the, my, my guiding sense is that Antigone's philia, um, the friendship in which, she, uh, in whose name she speaks when she speaks of burying her brother, of her relation to the previous dead for whom she's cared, and for those for whom she cares, um, uh, this relation of philia is fundamentally a philia for death. And so um, Antigone is, is not always coherent on this, um, but she is articulating a notion of philia that is um, rather, uh, rather extraordinary and forbidding. Um, now, this motif of a friendship, I, I, I use a phrase from Blanchot, a friendship with death, um, is something that um, actually I have been concerned about for a very long time. And I just mentioned this because this is going to uh, guide my, my approach. Um, my, my, some of my first work was on the topic of the question of mitzayim, of being with in, in Heidegger. And I tried to understand this relation um, from what Heidegger has to say about human finitude and our relation to mortality. And as some of you will know, I focused on a phrase in being in time that is quite extraordinary. Uh, Heidegger says, um, that we live with a voice of, voice of the friend that's always with us. And I tried to understand what is that? Who is that friend? What is that voice? And I came to a um, conclusion through my reading that this, this voice is speaking of death. Um, so of course, when I came to Antigone then uh, some years later when I was working on Lacan and Heidegger and Blanchot with regard to a question, a question of infant death, um, I discovered um, this motif in, in Antigone. 
so what I was doing then in reading Antigone was carrying forward what I was trying to think about with respect to the notion of friendship, the nature, the essence of friendship, the nature of friendship and community. Um, and community in the sense, uh, the Heideggerian sense of being with uh, Mitzayim, uh, which is the condition he says of there being a Dasein, right? So community is the condition of the singular being of the Dasein. Question is, what, are the, what, is the, what is the nature of that relationship, not, not the condition of that relationship, which is the condition of all relationships. And so I was pursuing that uh, via Antigone. And as I um, undertook that, I was, I was, uh, I was rereading Heidegger, uh, engaging with Lacan and, um, and, and carrying forward with Blanchot. And in, in recent years, I have returned to Heidegger on the topic of rhythm, actually. Um, and again, I find myself reading Antigone. Um, but in this case, it's with respect to Heidegger's understanding of Hölderlin's uh, reading of Antigone. And Hölderlin's reading of Antigone has become increasingly important for me. So that's the trajectory that I have followed with respect to Antigone and which I want to pursue a bit in the course of this seminar. In other words, I'd like to bring Antigone to the table um, uh, here um, with a consideration of the passages that I've referred to. And thereby, I, I, I hope to move through the play and in some ways recall it for you. I, I'm sure that all of you are deeply familiar with it, but um, of course it's, I, I don't know uh, your experience, but in rereading it in the last two weeks, I've once again been stunned. It's, it's uh, the, 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 the power of this and the enigmatic character of it and uh, uh, the force of it is extraordinary. Um, and it's difficult to hold a relation to that. And so it, one has to read and reread and, and, um, and, and it changes every time. Um, so I, I hope to, I actually hope to undertake that experience with you a bit um, by reading these lines together. Um, and then from there, I want to proceed to look at what um, Heidegger has to say about the play. Um, it, was, it was extremely important for him. And, and yet I think his reading has, as, as problems. He focuses on the notion of the uncanny. And um, he comes, uh, there are two instances of this. The first is in 1935 in an introduction to metaphysics, and some of you will, will be familiar with that. A text that you may be less familiar with is the, um, uh, the now translated uh, lectures on Hildenin of 1942 on the, on the uh, river hymn, the Easter. And um, in the middle of the, these lectures on Hölderlin, Heidegger turns to um, the choral ode, which he had focused on in 1935, to focus on this notion of the uncanny. And he declares that Antigone is the supreme uncanny. So <clears throat> um, I want to understand what, what's happening there. And I'm particularly interested in that because um, I think that Lacan's reading of um, uh, Antigone is deeply influenced by this Heideggerian um, approach. Um, <clears throat> so I will, <clears throat> I, I will, tomorrow I will uh, attend to those two texts from the basis of uh, where we started today. And then in a third day, um, I want to approach uh, what I think this, this may bring us for a reflection on community. And for that, I want to turn uh, then as a, for, for a guide to Blanchot. Uh, curiously enough, uh, to my knowledge anyway, Blanchot never talks about Antigone. And this is a very strange um, uh, lacuna, I would say, because um, everything points to the, the, the appropriateness of him turning to it. Appropriate is the wrong word. But um, it's, it, it, it's, it seems like an obvious text for him. And yet um, there's no, uh, I'm not aware of any record of, of a reading of a, uh, undertaken of an interpretation. He reads Oedipus, he, he reads uh, uh, Homer, um, he reads myths, of course, you know about Orpheus and Eurydice. And, um, uh, he, he's deeply involved with uh, um, the Greek texts of those that he, he is close to, like Heidegger, but <clears throat> he does not discuss Antigone. Nevertheless, I think a lot of what he says can help in relation to some of the issues that um, come up in Antigone. And so I'd like to, <clears throat> excuse me, approach then the question of community 
um, from the basis of meditation on uh, community and mortality. Um, I'd like to approach it with Blanchot to, to conclude. So that's the trajectory I have in mind. Um, I start with Antigone. I've already I've, I've gone on for a little bit. <laughs> so I'm not going to get through everything on friendship and Antigone. Uh, so we'll be going into that a little bit tomorrow. But uh, that's the trajectory I have in mind. And um, I thank you for your patience. And let's get started then with Antigone. Um, I want to... I want to take a break perhaps um, in about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, maybe I'll wait for a signal from um, Peruz or Nemanja. Um, but I will try to get started now. If, um, and yes, we'll take a break for, for, for maybe about seven minutes um, at about 20 past 12. And then I'll, I will continue until one. Okay, I think I have touched upon um, everything I wanted to bring you by, by way of introduction. Let me, let me then approach the play. I have used for many years, and this is um, it's almost it's just, I don't know. For many years, I, I, it's, it's familiarity. Uh, for many years, I've used um, the translation by Elizabeth uh, Wyckoff. Um, and I have consulted many translations. Um, this, I do want to <clears throat> mention that the, the text is of extraordinary difficulty um, in, in terms of the, the Greek. And so one translation is never enough. I mean, one has to, one has to uh, uh, traverse uh, as many as one can, and if, if one can also consult the Greek. Um, and, and as you do that, you'll realize that um, there is, there's no such thing as a correct translation of, of uh, Antigone. Um, it, is, it is of a difficulty that's um, really quite immeasurable. Holonen was one of the translators um, and Holonen's translation of Antigone and Oedipus were taken, his translations were taken by what Walter Benjamin is to represent the, in some sense, the highest summit and also slightly disastrous heights of the um, of the task or, or the task of translation that nobody went quite as far as Holonen and um, but it's also a very enigmatic translation that he makes so I'm also listening to Holonen as, as, as I um, work with Wyckoff's translation but um, it, it, whatever translation you're looking at is fine <laughs> precisely for what I uh, what I want to say then that there is no correct translation we have to try to find a, a uh, a point of thought together um, across this gulf of uh, that is translation and, and the, the, the extant translations. All of us with our individual uh, linguistic capacities. And I, I have to acknowledge, I'm no philologist when it comes to the classics. So um, let me get started then. And uh, again, my, my question is Antigone's philia the nature of um, this thing that she calls philia. <clears throat> and it gets played out immediately in the text and from the very first uh, verses. So I begin with her incredible address to, um, to Ismin. Um, incredible and in some ways terrifying. Um, it's early morning. Um, Antigone immediately confronts, confronts Ismin with a sentence that is itself almost untranslatable. Um, and I actually, for a very nice commentary on this, there's a book called Antigone's by George uh, Steiner. And uh, Steiner pauses over the sentence at, at some length. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it, it says something like this, oh, my shared sisterly head of Ismin. Um, so immediately there is a, there's an incredible intimacy uh, evoked in this vocative, which we don't have in English, actually. Um, so that she's immediately uh, a sisterly intimacy of what she understands to be fear. My sister, my Ismin, do you know of any suffering from our father sprung that Zeus does not achieve for us survivors? There's nothing grievous, nothing free from doom, nor shameful, not, nor, not dishonest, dishonored, I've not seen. 
your sufferings and mine, and now what of this edict, which they say the commander has proclaimed to the whole people? Have you heard anything? Or don't you know that the foe's trouble comes upon our friends? I'm gonna, I need to have a, a reference to the, to the Greek here soon. So let me get that in place. Immediately when Antigone refers to friends here, she is, <clears throat> she's evoking the relation of Philos. Um, yeah, one moment, I will be there. So immediately they reference to Philos with this notion of friends. And Ismin, who hasn't heard the edict, um, and maybe in some sense hasn't fully heard Antigone's address, responds with a reference to friends that's not the same as, as Antigone's. I've heard no word, Antigone, of our friends. Not sweet nor bitter since that single moment when we lost two brothers. We two lost two brothers who died on one day by a double blow. And since the Argive army went away this very night, I have no further news of fortune or disaster for myself. Friends is, is understood here in a broader sense. She doesn't understand it to be referring to, to the two brothers. Antigone, I knew it well and brought you from the house for just this reason that you alone may hear. What is it? Clearly some news has clouded you. It has indeed. Creon will give the one of our two brothers honor in the tomb, the other none. And immediately she describes the edict, says that Creon is, has declared these orders as she says to you and to me. And immediately there's that underscoring, yes, yes, I say to me, and this is Antigone in, in her extraordinary uh, solitude, um, uh, which is already starting to um, manifest itself with regard to Ismi. Uh, she claims that, you know, in some sense, this edict is, is, is for her. Um, and Ismin is, is reacts in, in, in shock. He says, well, what are we to do about this? Um, and Antigone comes back immediately and says, well, will you take up that corpse with me? Um, and Ismin still, you mean to bury him when it's forbidden? And Antigone is realizing already that she's, she's not quite there. Um, Antigone, my brother and yours, though you may wish he were not, I never shall be found to be his traitor. It's mean, oh, heart of mind, when Creon spoke against it, she's reacting to her sister's extremity. Of course, this is Antigone, that's very extreme. It's not for him to keep me from my own. This is again, a relation of, of uh, a relation of philos. And it's mean, now, Response refers to the to the events in a very formal way. Um, I won't pause over the the, the 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 passage right now, but there is a uh, there's a certain formality to her evocation of the impossibility of responding to the of Creon's edict in the context of um, uh, their situation as women in in the city. Um, I know, she concludes her next, this, this passage, I know that wild and futile action makes no sense. At which point Antigone has heard this distance, has heard it clearly, and she draws the line. I wouldn't urge it. And if now you wished to act, you wouldn't please me as a partner. Be what you want to, but that man shall I bury. For me, the doer, death is best. Friend, shall I lie with him? Yes, friend with friend when I have dared the crime of piety. Phile met oton, ke somai filu meta. The word meta comes twice. I will lie with him. 
friend with friend. Um, and of course, this immediately evokes the, the, the issue, the, the, the big problem devoted, uh, debated in this play regarding incest. Uh, because these, her way of phrasing this is suggesting that um, a, a very intimate relation with the brother. But again, I, I want to suggest that we look at this in relation to the notion of philia. Friend, shall I lie with him? Yes, friend with friend, when I have dared the crime of piety. Um, you, you, she goes on, you may see fit to keep from honor what the gods have honored. This means, again, is recoiling. I, I do not dishonor but to act against the citizens. Again, the citizens in, in, in terms of the range of this term philos, citizens are also philos. Um, so she is still within a relation of feeling in her obedience to Creon, but in relation to Ismin, there is an absolute separation over this relation of philia. Antigone, that's your protection. Now I go to pile the burial mound for him, my dearest brother. How I fear for you. For me, don't borrow trouble. Clear your fate. This mean, at least give no warning of this act. You keep it hidden and I'll do the same. And Antigone again reacts and uh, erupts. No, denounce me. Suggesting, I think that the act to which she feels called has to be a public act. Um, she, has to, to, uh, uh, she has to mourn her brother in, in, a, in a public right, and the defiance must be public, given the order against you, which suggests that we're already in a, in a, in a rather strange place of a quasi-public debate um, about feeling. Uh, there's already a political dimension uh, to this debate. Um, I'm not aware of philia uh, you know, having this public dimension in. Um, in, in such a context, although um, the, the term philos in, um, in, in Homer actually does uh, evoke a, a very public relation. In other words, the two, the two individuals who are um, in, involved in a relation, for example, hospitality and um, guest, or two people in relation for whom there's some sort of contract, um, they are, they are philos, and this is a, a public relation. Um, so th there is that dimension in Homer, but with Antigone, with this particular gesture of demanding the right to burial, the public character of it is, is, um, is particular, I think, and, and, and important. It's mean, you have a hot mind over chilly things. Antigone, I know I please those whom I most should please. Yes, I mean, if but you can, you crave what can't be done. And so Antigone says, when strength runs out, I shall give over. Wrong from the start to chase what cannot be. Now, Ismin is saying that it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's practically speaking, this is, absurd, it's impossible, what, what, what as, uh, Antigone is proposing. Uh, you, you should not take your point of departure from something Im impractical, absolutely impractical, impossible. Um, Antigone, on the other hand, has chosen the impossible in some way. And here I'm using impossible in a slightly different sense, not the practical sense, but something um, maybe even closer to what bataille means by the impossible. Um, in any case, she is she's taking it as her arche, right? From the from her from the from the ground forward, she's taking the impossible as her objective. This is something that Heidegger will will focus on at some length. Um, but it, it again it defines the nature of this act, which is absolutely separate from what Ismin can um, can imagine. Antigone, if that's your saying. I shall hate you first, and next the dead will hate you in all justice. We have to hear these words of hatred. Um, in a few moments, Antigone will tell us that she doesn't share in hatred, she shares in love. But the relation to the sister is absolute. Yeah. And she won't come back. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see another exchange. She does not come back from this, uh, this absolute 
uh, stance that she has in her, in what is an absolute solitude. But let me and my own ill counseling suffer this terror. Suffer this terror. This is again, Heidegger will pick this up. Um, Patein, the suffering of the dynon, of, of the terrible, or of the uncanny, as he translates it. Um, Antigone proceeds from a suffering of this dynon. I shall suffer nothing as great as dying with a lack of grace. This means go since you want to, but know this, you go senseless indeed, but loved by those who love you. And she's a broken figure. Once again, I, I, won't, um, I won't attempt to read the Greek too much for you, but anyway, the, the, the term there is philia. So we have uh, already with Antigone and Ismene, we have a, an extraordinary um, debate over the act that must be done and the meaning of that act and the nature of the relation that's, that's behind that act. The chorus comes in. Let's see what time is it. Let me look for, for five more minutes. Is this um, uh, when Antigone confronts Creon. Um, I trust you'll, you'll be reading Antigone over and over and have read it over and over um, before this. I, I just read Lacan's, again, uh, Lacan's chapters on Antigone. He makes them, he teases his audience wonderfully. Um, I'm sure you haven't bothered to look at the text, um, but actually I'm sure you have. So. Anyway, the chorus comes in and um, we have that remarkable scene with the messenger who's um, a, bit of, a bit of a buffoon playing with language in a very sophisticated way with, with Creon. It's, it's a strange, strange interlude. Then the, the guard who had made off feeling he had gotten away with, uh, uh, with a lot less than he expected comes back. He says, incredible luck, I've got her. Um, and uh, the, the guard presents what has happened and Antigone uh, now confronts Creon. Creon, we're at line 441 in the play. You there, whose head is drooping to the ground. Do you admit this or do you deny it? I say I did it and I don't deny it. Then to the guard, take yourself off wherever you wish, free of a heavy charge. And he addresses Antigone, you, tell me not at length, but in a word. You knew the order not to do this thing. Antigone, I knew, of course I knew. The word was plain. And still you dared to overstep these laws. And she now gives the, one of the key statements that guides um, so many interpretations of the play. For me, it was not Zeus who made that order. Holden in, as I know, it translates, it was not my Zeus who made that order. Um, but here, right, we go. For me, it was not Zeus who made that order, nor did that justice who lives with the gods below mark out such laws to hold among mankind. Neither Zeus, in, in this translation, neither Zeus nor justice from below, Hades. So this, what she is um, speaking from is a relation beyond either of these. Nor did I think your orders were so strong that you, a mortal man, could overrun the gods' unwritten and unfailing laws. Not now, nor yesterday's, they always live, and no one knows their origin in time. So not through fear of any man's good spirit would I be likely to neglect these laws, proud spirit would I be likely to neglect these laws, drawing myself the gods' sure punishment. I knew that I must die, how could I not, even without your warning? If I die before my time, I say it is a gain. Who lives in sorrows many as are mine, how shall he not be glad to gain his death? And so for me to meet this fate, no grief. But I left, if I left that corpse, my mother's son dead and unburied, I'd have cause to grieve as now I grieve not. And if you think my acts are foolishness, the foolishness may be in a fool's eye. They go back and forth. 
Creon um, immediately assumes a distinctly political position um, and uh, very much the position of the male leader, um, will not take such insolence from, uh, from Antigone um, and, and claims his right um, to uh, right and, 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 and intention to, to act. Antigone um, dismisses. <laughs> Why are you waiting? Nothing that you say fits with my thought. Nothing in his uh, justification for his act is, speaks to Antigone. They then continue with um, a debate, really, um, in which Creon, again, will define the proper meaning of philia for him. And Antigone will, will counter him. For Creon, as, uh, um, as he says uh, quite, quite explicitly, philia must be thought from the, uh, uh, the, the condition of philia, the condition of friendship is the state. All relations must take their ground, take their possibility from the state and all relations of philia. Um, Antigone, refuses that, um, that claim. And as, as we've seen, speaks in the name of this law, this unwritten law from the, that comes from beyond either justice in Hades or uh, from the edicts of Zeus. Creon is, all, it's, 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 he, he's trying to, he can't believe this, uh, um, but he's, 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 and he's debating it. Um, and Creon, will not admit that an en enemy can be a friend. He, he wants to draw an absolute distinction between the enemy and the friend. And he has a political understanding of enemy and then uh, a political understanding of friend. Um, Antigone refuses this and says, um, I'm about page, uh, line 519 now, um, or let me go up a little bit about 516. I think your act of grace in his regard is crime. Antigone, corpse below would never say it was. Creon, when you honor him and the criminal just alike, it was a brother, not a slave who died. Died to destroy this land, the other guarded. And Antigone, death yearns for equal law for all the dead. Creon, not that the good and bad draw equal shares. And then Antigone pronounces a sentence that is, I think, quite important. Who knows that this is holiness below? Creon, never the enemy, even in death, a friend. Antigone, I cannot share in hatred, but in love. Creon, then go down there if you must and love the dead. No woman rules me while I live. Throughout this passage, um, all these references to friend and love, the word that is echoing is, is philos. Um, again, never the enemy, even death, a friend. I cannot share in hatred, but in love. The, the, um, the Greek there, utoi su sunekthen ala summoi len ephun. Um, sumic, sumic thing, ala, sum, oil, sum feeling, excuse me, sum feeling, there it is, sum feeling. I share in love, forgive me, my, my Greek is halting. Um, I cannot share in hatred, but in love. Now, just a couple of things and I'll, and I'll pause. In that line, death yearns for equal law for all the dead. And then Creon, not that the good and draw bad equal shares. Antigone, who knows that this is holiness below? Her, uh, the Greek, as, as uh, Haldanen reads it, says the following, who knows what usage there might be below? And this, I, I actually, this is the line upon which Heidegger's interpretation turns. Who knows what usage may lie below? Creon. <laughs> 
never the enemy, even in death, a friend. Antigone, I cannot share in hatred, but in love. Now, the question uh, which the commentators struggle over this is, uh, what is the basis of this? I mean, the number of Antigone's lines really lend themselves to a, a kind of Christianization of the play. And this is one of them. Um, but the, the question is, what, what is the, on what grounds does she make this claim? Is this something natural to her? Uh, is she claiming that it's, it's natural? It's by, of my nature. I cannot share in hatred, but in love. Is she saying this by birth? Is this um, uh, birth and thereby invoking a, a, a relation of kinship? Because normally when we think of uh, the, the law to which Antigone answers, it's, it is a, um, it's, bound, it's, 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 it's defined by kinship relations. Um, and of course, if, you, if you've had a chance to look at Hegel's um, interpretation, um, you will, you'll, you'll know about this you know, the division between the political order and the ethical uh, substance, the political order and, um, and, and the order of, uh, and the order cared for by the family um, and, 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 the, and what's involved in the kinship relations. So uh, what is Antigone's uh, impetus here? Um, on, on what ground does she say, I cannot share in hatred and love? We have just seen Antigone declare hatred for her sister. Um, so it, it is a, it's, it's hard to understand at this point. Because everything in the play, I, I think, and I'm, I wanna come back to this at some point and talk about it because the, this act, so much of this action is strange. And so there, there is such a, um, uh, well, it's incredibly challenging and, and almost unthinkable at certain moments, but, but there are strange movements and, and, and it's, uh, it's not moving in a representational way is what I want to say, um, in the sense of a, a normal action. Um, so she has just excluded her sister in hatred. And then she says, I cannot share in hatred, but in love. So what, what is the basis? And my sense would be that what she means in sharing here is it's something like what, what the, the basis of her sharing is something like a natural impetus, but it is natural for her to incline toward death. Um, or, or actually, we're going to see it's natural for her to incline toward death, but here's she, what, she, what she claims as, as love. I cannot share in hatred, but in love. In other words, Antigone's philia um, has, is, is defined by a, an inclination toward the dead. Um, it is defined by a, she leans toward, she gives favor to the dead. Here I am again calling upon Heidegger and his commentary on uh, philene and the verb um, and how it appears in Heraclitus when he says, uh, physis cryptistai uh, philae, um, physis loves to hide. And he, he analyzes the philene there and says, this is an, it's, it, it's an inclination. It's a, it's a giving favor. It's a giving over to. This is how um, Heidegger would interpret her understanding of philia. Uh, that is that she leans toward, she inclines toward, she gives favor toward. And that is what is her nature. Um, so yes, she can hate her sister, <laughs> but she leans to love. When, when love is as she understands it, this philia, which is, as I've been trying to suggest, is um, very much marked by her relation to the dead and her care for the dead. So, um, Creon um, now starts his encounter with Ismene and Antigone. And so let me, let me pause there for just a couple minutes, um, regroup a little bit. I've been I've been staring at myself for almost an hour now. Um, so let me just, just uh, it's, it's actually 35 past the hour. So give me just five minutes, um, five to seven minutes. I'll come back and um, we'll, we'll continue uh, into the next stage of this, um, this drama around the question of philia. Thank you. I'll be back in about five to seven minutes. Sounds good. If anyone has questions, you can post them on the Q&A now. Um, that'd be great.
So everyone knows that uh, we're still going. I'm just going to play some music in the background until we start again. And then the signal for the music being off would be the lecture starting for those of you stepping away from your computers. Please come We just realized that if uh, we play music, uh, YouTube might kill our stream because uh, we need the copyright for it. Um, so uh, we'll just we'll just be in silence for a few more minutes until Chris is back. Bruce, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Good. Okay. So, folks, we're we're back from the break, and uh, we're going to continue where we left off.
quick little break. The um, time is time is very tight, and um, I felt as I was uh, in that last section that I was racing to the text, and that was um, that's troubling. But at the same time, uh, there's no way to read this entire text in, in the time that we have. And um, I'm hoping that you will have a chance to go back and read it yourselves at your leisure. I uh, particularly know that the first passage that I read, the second too, but the first passage, I mean, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's, it's Antigone's um, encounter with this. I mean, it's, 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 it's really extraordinary. Um, and then her, uh, her account of what she's doing, her first account of what she's doing here is, um, again, uh, incredibly powerful. But we are now at, um, I'm, I'm up to about um, line 530. And I was trying to raise a question there at the end with regard to that, that line, I cannot share in hatred, but in love. Uh, let me just reiterate that I'm trying to address the question of the nature of Antigonus philia. Um, if we follow Hegel and the long tradition, um, it's, it, Hegel's reading is of incredible importance in the, in the reception of the play. Um, we will have to understand that philia as based in relations of kinship. Um, certainly a lot of what Antigone does is defined in those terms um, and is determined on that basis and, and on the basis of her, her entire history. Of course, she has been caring for the dead in her family. And this is not just any family. And so obviously the, the evocation of these relations will be echoing with all the issues of incest and the terrible affliction of this family, that the term that Bacon picks up so on so heavily in the ate, the, the affliction, the suffering, the terrible fate that they have been through. So that, yes, of course, Antigone's philia is very much defined by kinship relations. The reason I emphasize so much this uh, relation to uh, Ismin and the way she treats Ismin at the outset, and, and we'll see a bit more of what I'm referring to, I think, um, suggests to me that um, this, th th her act is impelled by another sense or something more in Philia than these kinship determinations. Um, and she's referring to that, of course, when she says, I'm answering an unwritten law. I'm, I, um, I do not accept your law, Kriya. I'm, I'm responding to something else. And she's very, very, very powerful in, 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 in evoking that other law, that other usage, as Helenin describes it. Um, so I, I'm trying to understand uh, then how how she is responding in the kinship relation uh, in philia. And I think that there is something like, uh, as I'm trying to say, an inclination toward death, toward, the, toward the, the order of the dead, but toward death itself in some sense. You know that Lacan will say that she, she embodies the death drive. Um, I, I don't want to rush to that, um, that interpretation. Um, I mean, I accept what he's saying, but that that phrasing doesn't do so much for me. But um, I, I'm, I'm putting that wrong. <laughs> it's, it's very powerful, but it, I, I, I don't mean to come to Lacan's conclusion. I'm trying to understand this 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 inclination, this favor for the for 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 the dead in her relation to death. Um. So okay, and Creon says, "All right, if you have to love, go love the dead." Indeed, that is Antigone's inclination. Again, it's a sort of terrible Sophoclean irony. Ismene comes out. And Creon accuses her. Um, Ismene, I did the deed. If she agrees, I did. I am accessory and share the blame. Antigone, justice will not allow this. You did not wish for a part, nor did I give you one. 
you are in trouble, and I'm not ashamed to sail beside you into suffering. Death and the dead, they know whose act it was. I cannot love a friend whose love is words can feel you. Sister, I pray, don't fence me out from honor, from death with you and honor done the dead. Don't die along with me, nor make your own that which you did not do. My death's enough. This mean when you are gone, what life can be my friend? Love Creon, he's your kinsman and your care. It's a devastating word. Why hurt me when it does yourself no good? I also suffer when I laugh at you. What further service can I do now? To save yourself, I shall not envy you. Yes, I mean, alas for me, am I outside your fate? Yes, for you chose to live when I chose death. At least I was not silent, you were warned. Some will have thought you wiser, some will not. And yet the blame is equal for us both. Take heart, you live. My life died long ago, and that has made me fit to help the dead. Um, I, I don't think I need to go farther here. What is, uh, what's so, again, it's, 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 it's a terrible exchange. Um, terrible in the sense it's awesome. And, and uh, Antigone is in her absolute solitude, refusing her sister again, who at this moment is effectively committing an act of solidarity, which will cost her her life. Right? She is committing herself to death um, by asking her sister to let her join her in this companionship. Um, and Antigone refuses her. Um, is this means this means act not an act of female in, in the same sense that Antigone has been pursuing. She commits herself to death in love for her sister. Antigone's answer is, I think, almost lapidary and, and, and again, devastating. She says, you want to be with me in death because, as you said, life can no longer be of interest to you. Um, life can no longer be your friend, as she puts it in the, in the Wyckoff translation. <clears throat> in other words, you have chosen death on the basis of your sense that life is not worth living now. In other words, you choose death from life. I have chosen death in the name of death. Absolute distinction between the two. Ismin chooses life uh, and has chosen life and is still in some sense speaking in the name of life, even though she's choosing suicide. Antigone speaks of, speaks, speaks of, of a commitment to death in the name of death. Again, this is why I'm trying to say that Antigone's philia is for death or is, is taken by death or taken in this relation to death. She died long ago. She serves death. She inclines to death. So again, this mean is, is excluded. Antigone is now facing the, the death sentence, which um, Creon doesn't hesitate to deliver now. And at this point, Hermann comes onto the scene, um, again with um, Creon and, and Hermann, we find a debate over the nature of philia. Um, if you look around the, uh, page 650, uh, excuse me, line 650, 652, or even preceding that around 645, um, Creon says that, yes, we, we all admire an obedient son who um, gives due honor to their father's friends. Again, he's speaking of a, of a, a philia, which has to do with the relation between citizens um, and also kinship relations, the son should obey the father in a proper loving way by honoring the father's friends and so on and so forth. And, um, and then when he talks about Antigone, he says, oh, don't worry, you know, there are others out there. Um, why would you want to be with um, a, a wicked woman, as he puts it, as Wyckoff translates. And he goes on, what deeper wounding than a friend, no friend. 
So again, the, the definition of, of philia by Creon is absolutely firm. Um, let her sing her song of Zeus who guards the kindred. Um, he is, he's giving a political interpretation of Antigone's act um, in, his, in his manner. Um, and, and we have in what follows a very strong statement about that political commitment. Um, I'm a line about 664 or so. The man the state has put in place must have obedient hearing to his least command when he is right and even when it's not. He who accepts this teaching I can trust, ruler or ruled, to function in his place. Um, there is no greater wrong than disobedience. This ruins cities and so on and so forth. And he ends up saying, I will not be weaker than womankind. Um, so he, all of the oppositions are, political oppositions are, are brought into play here. And we have really, it's politics over against Antigone. Heman is, starts to hesitate. He starts to, to um, uh, vacillate. Um, and he says, you, you, you are not attending to, you're not able to attend to what is starting to circulate in the city. And here, I, I, I pause over this for a moment because I, I think it's quite important that, at least for me, I've always been, I try to fathom the presence of the, of the people, if I may put it that way. You know, the, all of these others who are in the background, um, which uh, Heman now refers to, he says, your, pri your presence frightens any common man from saying things you would not care to hear. That's in line 690. But in dark corners, I have heard them say how the whole town is grieving for this girl. There's general grief, mourning starting <clears throat> throughout the, the town. That, um, so the, the, the people, according to him, on at this in this political, very political exchange where he's trying to address the father, at first respectfully, um, the whole town is grieving. He says and who is unjustly doomed, if ever woman was, to die in shame for glorious action done. So now that the terms of the debate are taking form, he starts to strengthen his account of the glory in her, in her, in her act of philia. And this will go to the point where um, they, they are in full dispute, full agon and uh, uh, Creon, I'm jumping way ahead now to line, I'm, I'm at about line 645. Uh, they're, they're now exchanging words and uh, Heman is even at the point of sort of quibbling with words in a somewhat sophistic way. And, um, it's it's you know, very much a Sophoclean encounter, verbal encounter. Um, I, I just want to pause over that, but let me continue. Creon, wicked to try conclusions with your father. Heman, when you conclude unjustly, so I must. Am I unjust when I respect my office? And Heman, you tread down the gods due. Respect is gone. That, something happens, I think, there. The, 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 the encounter crystallizes. Heman now says what, I, I, I'm, I'm inclined to read this as, yes, this is what the city sees. This is now the objective truth, so to speak. And the play turns um, at this, this part of the play, this where Creon is involved. I'm drawing a little bit on Hilden in there who reads this line as, again, a turning point. Um, and, but it, it does strike me as uh, powerful in that way. Um, Okay, Haman goes off, as you know, in fury. And at that point, uh, Haman, his last words, uh, you, um, she, she, he demands that, that Antigone be brought out to die in his presence. He responds, not at my side, her death, and you will not ever lay eyes upon my face again. Find other friends to rave with after this other friends. He goes off um, and the chorus asks, what, what are you going to do now? And Creon dictates what, what his intention is, which is to um, send her to this hollowed cave. And here 
um, I think I will pause and, and then complete the, the, the reading tomorrow. I pause here because um, we are, uh, we're now at a, at a, a quite, quite an important juncture. Um, this is the part of the play where Antigone is, well, she's now in Lamentation and she appears in that extraordinary beauty that, um, that Lacan picks up on, but is, is, you know, runs throughout the history of, of responses to the play. She is, she, she's transfigured in, in this moment um, at which she's approaching her death. The nature of Creon's condemnation, I think is quite important for what I'm trying to approach. He's condemning her to something between life and death, um, between the dead and the living, um, between the, the, the light and the dark. Um, but she, as she goes to her death, uh, and she um, has, has her famous evocations of Niobe um, uh, um, and so forth, um, she, she appears in a splendor that is, um, uh, that is quite extraordinary. Um, Lacan speaks of uh, the image of the beautiful. Um, Heidegger, for his part, I think he's reading this section. Heidegger, Heidegger gets completely uh, taken by this. And he says that Antigone is the pure poem, the pure poem. And I think part of what he's referring to is this apparition, this, this appearance of Antigone. Um, but we should also read a little bit her, um, her plaint in the Comos. Um, as I just, just leapt out of me, line 919. I go without a friend, struck down by fate, live to the hollow chambers of the dead. She's constantly saying, I am friendless. So there is a, she's, in a, she's in a terrible solitude at this point, going toward her death. And then the play moves toward its fierce ending. Okay. Um, I'm watching the time. I don't even know if I need to be watching the time so carefully. You know, in a seminar, you can feel whether it's appropriate to. We're right at, uh, we're right at uh, almost 10 a.m. now. And so I don't know when, how long, how much longer you wanted to go. But well, actually, I, I t this is the official ending time, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So um, we have I have several questions already in the Q&A board. I don't know if you want to deal with a couple of them now or not. Well, it's um, in principle, we, we end in two minutes. I, I think that um, I, I will uh, try to obey that, um, that rule for the moment for, for today. Um, I, 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 everybody has different forms of schedules and we're in different parts of the world. world. But um, let, me, let me just come to an ending now and then review what has been sent in <clears throat> and then also what will come and then tomorrow I can, uh, I can I can gauge that a little bit and work with it. It'll be it would it would be very difficult for me to make much of what what is in front of me um, in the of immediate. It's just a couple I, of minutes. I, I figured as much as well. Yeah. I also wanted to remind folks that we we are getting some uh, questions via email uh, and on the chat, but we do have a the Q and A board for everybody. So if it's uh, to make it easier for us to compile these questions, because there's several several dozens now, if you can put it in the Q&A board, which is right next to the share screen button. I don't know if they have the share screen button, right next to the um, chat button. It should say Q&A for all of you. Yeah, yeah I see that myself. Let me say that um, I, <clears throat> I don't approach this play as a, with a, with a pretense of, I gotta say, a classicist scholarly reading. Um, I'm coming at it from, uh, you know, my own trajectory and thinking and reading literature, uh, my own questions, and I, I tried to mention those to you before. And so uh, I, 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 I actually, I, I want to convey. I, I approach this with a lot of humility. This, this play, um, uh, all of Sophocles, but but this play is particularly I feel quite a sense of humility. This is this is really really enigmatic in, in ways, incredibly powerful, incredibly important, and um, I do not want to pretend to a knowledge that I, I I can't claim. And in some ways, I want to honor the ambiguity and and, and enigma of this. I, I want to hold on to this. Um, that's partly what I'm. Was trying to say at the outset, I want to read this play 
for the resonance it might bring to our thinking right now, to, to the echoes it might give us, to, to our own attempts, all of our attempts to try to make sense of where we are in this terrible moment. Um, you know, I thought of Antigone in part as I thought of Oedipus. These are moments of plague in, in, in the city. Um, it's, it's becoming a kind of plague in the city. Um, when, when the dogs are dropping, you know, are, are the dogs and the birds are leaving their droppings from the corpses all, all over. And, uh, uh, when Tiresias comes and he says, things are severely out of joint, um, this has to stop. Um, of course, Oedipus starts in a moment of, of plague. Um, again, I don't want to thematize that. I don't want to allegorize Antigone. Um, I don't want to uh, in any way um, you know, turn this into, I don't want to use it for some theoretical statement. I want to use it, I use it, in, I'm thinking of uses. I want to use it in the sense that it can perhaps inform, inspire, and, uh, and question at the same time what, 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 whatever I can bring to it. So um, I would be most grateful for questions that contribute to this problem, um, or even statements. You know, if, if you have thoughts, that, you know that they don't have to be in agreement with what I'm saying. But I, but I, I'm, I'm most interested in in responses that that contribute to to the discussion. Um, as opposed to a, a question that seeks some sort of defense on my part of my interpretation. I mean, I'll do what I can, but um, I'm not so interested in defending my interpretation. I'm interested in seeing what can be brought forth. Um, Chris, we have, a, we have two questions from uh, Avital Ronel. Yeah. Um, she well, posted, posted them via YouTube channel. Uh-huh. Uh, she asked if you can say more about Antigone's craving, uh, what cannot be? And second thing is she asks, who do you identify with? Creon, Ismin, or the dead guy? Who do I identify with? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm certainly identifying with Antigone. Um, uh, Heman has always been a, a bit of an enigmatic figure to me. Um, and Hildenen takes him very seriously. And I, I find that interesting, um, but he is he, he's somewhat abstract for me. Um, Creon is uh, almost, um, he's a bit of a, um, it's a bit cardboard for me. Um, his, all of his words echo so much with the kind of, uh, it's, it's almost cliched, you know, if you, after reading Oedipus, you come to Antigone and, and there's um, Creon uh, with the same, oh, you're corrupted by the, the money and so on and so forth. Of course, Antigone was written first, but uh, nevertheless, it, it already sounds cliched when, when, when I read Creon. Um, that said, um, you know, it, it is a, it, it is, it, he is a tragic figure. And, um, and so I think that to the extent that there is uh, a catharsis involved here and catharsis entails some form of, I wouldn't, I don't want to use the word identification, but some form of partic participation, mimesis. Um, and so far as there is this mimetic dimension, we are responding to Creon, I would say, as a tragic figure. Um, I, I don't see how we cannot, it's terrible. What, what comes upon him, despite the the, um, the, the, the the crudeness of his error. I mean, uh, it's, it's crude in many ways, including the fact that uh, he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't take Tiresias' advice very well. I mean, it's, he makes he makes a bad move, but and that's 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 superficial. Um, but but it is you know what what happens with with um, Creon is is. It's genuinely tragic if I need to follow this line of thinking that I have. With Antigone, um, there is a different, uh, I, I, Antigone is a tra certainly a tragic figure in, in the way we use that term tragic today. Uh, and that's sort of the way I'm evoking it with Creon in relation to what we have taken from Aristotle and, and the history of, of the philosophy of tragedy. Um, Antigone is a far more enigmatic figure, I think. Um, more obscure in her actions, and and I think certainly tragic in 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 in, in any philosophical sense. Um, 
but at the same time, there is that, that she really is at an extreme. Uh, she stands at an extreme point, an extreme point of destitution, an extreme point of commitment and engagement. Um, and, uh, and, and her fall is, I mean, this, this is, this is Sophoclean, um, but she starts out going down. I mean, it's, it's the decisions made. It, it, it's, it will, it will unfold her drama. There is a drama, but part of it is, is the drama of going to her death and, and the comos and the, and the lamentation. But um, Antigone is a witness, a martyr in a very different sense from Creon. And um, I also think that her act has dimensions that are utterly admirable, you know, and, and I stand in admiration for Antigone. And that's why I, in the last session, I will talk a little bit about Blanchot's notion of refusal. She reminds me of um, what, what I read in Blanchot about refusal. Um, but it's a refusal also as in Blanchot that, that it's, that comes from beyond the political order, or, or is not simply political. So um, uh, we have we have two. I mean, that's what's extraordinary about this. We have two figures here that that um, that that are difficult almost to put in the same space. I mean, it's it's um, and and the nature of the mimetic suffering with that goes on with the two figures, I think, is, is very different. Um, and that's why this splendor of Antigone that Lacan is so sensitive to and Heidegger uh, has, has a very particular character vis-a-vis uh, -vis Creon. I mean, it's, 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 there's nothing like that in Creon. It's, uh, Antigone has a, has a completely separate um, uh, phenomenon, phenomenon, appearance um, coming forth, shining. Um, and uh, as I, I don't want to, again, I don't want to allegorize, but I turn to Antigone today because I think I see Antigones around me um, and I see crayons. And um, so, yes, I'm, I'm sort of with Antigone in, in this. Um, but I, as I say, this is, a, this is an extremely complex structure of cathartic, I think there's catharsis here, Helen thought of. Uh, of cathartic, of, of a cathartic relation um, involving, again, not identification, but a mimetic participation. And um, yeah, but the nature of this participation, again, is, is what's at stake in this question of filia. If Antigone inclines to death, what is the nature of our being with Antigone? What does, if, if, if we react to her, desire to lie with the friend, uh, meta, you know, with this, this being with that she evokes. What is that speaking to in us? Um, if, if, as I am inclined to think, we're touching there on something that is at the great, very grounds of mitzvah, of being together, being with the other, of community. So um, the nature of, well, there are two forms of, of identification, you know, the political and then this other, which is pre-political. And I, I wanna come back to that. I think that this is a, a pre-political relation. That's why I was going over this question of the public character of her act. It's, um, uh, it's, it's a very interesting sort of threshold with regard to the, pol the political. But I think that Antigone's, um, what Antigone is answering to is ultimately something pre-political. And that's why it can't be named. That's why it can't be articulated unwritten it's it's um which doesn't make it less real it's, we'll see how heidegger deals with that um it's, it's really very interesting so um i hope that uh Abital, thank you for your questions i hope that is um something of an answer and again I, I i want to respect the time and we will come back tomorrow i will look at these questions and think a bit more about what i've said and and try to honor the, um, the rhythm of this. Um, and also your commitment, some of you have taken time to be here. So I, I don't want to go on too long. I, I'm, and I'm very grateful for, for participation of all of you. Thank you. And so with that, I will um, end. And I hope to see many of you, not see you, <laughs> be seen by many of you tomorrow. Thank you very much.
Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I've uh, copied down most of the questions so far. We've got a, a bunch on the YouTube stream as well. We're going to compile these and send them over to Chris, and he will deal with these first thing in the morning and then throughout uh, the next uh, next, next couple of classes. And remember, we'll also have a final Q&A day on the fourth day. So thank you all for joining us. We'll see you all tomorrow uh, morning for some of you and evening for others of you. And uh, I hope everyone's safe and takes care of themselves. I hope we all get to see each other soon as well physically.